GM, GM, how are you guys? Oops. Oops, let's go, go ahead. GM? Very good. Okay, today I'm here to talk about uh, the end of self custodian wallets and how governments and our friends are trying to ban them. And this is a lightning talk, so if you want to see the full presentations, please follow me on uh, X, formerly Twitter, because I'm going to post more slides there. And why does this matter? Is that if and when the government are going to restrict the use of self custodial wallets, it's so called bad ending. And at that point, it doesn't matter what you do there in the audience because you can all go home and work in a bank or a McDonald's. So it should be obvious for you why this is important. First, about the benefits of the self custodial wallets is that, uh, of course, the first one is that. Uh, we own our assets, it's, it's in our control, and there's no risk like you would have with the bank or a centralized exchange that something, they, they screw it up and you lose. If you lose, it's only your own fault. The other important point is vendor, no vendor lock-in, so you can change wallets. You are not locked in a single uh, wallet provider, but you can have a competition between those, and it's very good for uh, uh, cost efficiency because the cost will be very, very low for us. And you all know that we are not paying for our wallets. And the problem with the wallets is not the wallet themselves, but it's a crypto, and they enable the cryptocurrencies to flow freely. And it's no longer in this point uh, feasible to ban the crypto themselves. Instead, uh, what governments and regulators work is that they will restrict its use. And there are mainly three ways to do it. Uh, don't allow to transfer in and out from wallets. Regulate developers or regulate interactions with the wallets like a front-end, Uniswap. And this is how the regulation in the world is done. Why we care about the US politics is that all the trickle-down economics, except in this town, it's not money that trickles down, but it's the shit. So, uh, all the national regulators follow what the FITF is doing, and they are doing what the U.S. says them to do. And there's also the compliance industry who is uh, making money out of this. So they, for them, it's very beneficial that we will restrict the use of the wallets. So they, they will vote for more regulation every time. And the first case we have in Estonia. So uh, 2021, it was already almost there that they banned this. There was a compliance company that was lobbying the government that uh, we should actually not allow the DeFi platforms and the peer-to-peer to be uh, allowed and unless they register as a VSP provider, which means that they would need to KYC everybody. Didn't go through. Later we had a Mika, which overruled, and it's, I think it's, it's uh, st uh, still, still, still uh, allowed in Estonia. The second one is the European Union. So with their latest uh, anti-money laundering directive, they say that uh, transfers in and out self custodial wallet is still allowed, but the amounts are restricted. So you are only allowed to transfer, I think it's 1,000 euros. And uh, uh, it's going to be effective in uh, ne uh, next year or 2026. So after that, in European Union citizen, you really can't use your self custodial wallets if you have more than 1,000 euros in assets. Then we have a Seychelles. So this was the first country that not in a guidance, but in a law itself, uh, somebody, somebody, I don't know who, wrote in the law that the non-custodial services, including wallets, uh, should be regulated. And it means that the developers should sign up there uh, with the local regulator if you are developing a wallet. It didn't make to the final law text, but it was explicitly also said that this request came from uh, uh, FATF, uh, and uh, they wanted to uh, close this so-called loophole for the users. And then there's a Denmark where they told that uh, Uniswap and others can be identified, so that's why uh, developers like these should be also registered in Denmark as a VASP, because they can offer services for Danish citizens. 
And what can you do? So, first of all, raise awareness of these issues, tweet, uh, try to donate to the organizations who are pro-crypto. I think in the United States we succeed quite well. And most important is that you speak with local media in your own country and try to get the credible people there to uh, lobby for the privacy and the right to uh, own your own assets. Thank you. And the next questions. Thank you very much. So again, if somebody has any question, please raise your hand. I will toss the mic to you. Yep, we have one. Yeah, better. <laughs> it's a bit far. Uh, so, of course, you can ban uh, alcohol, um, uh, as they tried to in the US, obviously, and, uh, but it's an enforcement issue. Um, do you think that's any, going to give us any, any sort of, um, those sort of, that example, does that give us any reason to have hopium? Um, I think your talk was great, by the way, thanks, it's so important. I'm not trying to dumb this down, it's really important, but is there hopium out there that, you know, this isn't going to be enforced? We think we have to work a bit harder than that. I mean, it depends, because when they banned alcohol, it was like 100 years ago, and the surveillance state didn't exist. Uh, today, governments can follow your actions, and especially the actions of the software companies and developers very closely, so they, will, they can come to knock your door if you have a GitHub, GitHub account. So that's why I'm uh, quite pessimistic that it, this can uh, fly under radar, so to speak. So there are bad people out there who do bad things, and while you can argue with how the regulations are laid out, you, there's not much argument that terrorist financing and money laundering shouldn't be allowed. So how do we, I think we all in this here, we believe in self-sovereignty, but we also, many of us probably think that zero knowledge is a potential solution. How do we get the governments to try it? Because they're not, it's not even in the Overton window of discussing these new technologies. How do we get them to actually approve a test case or some way of trying it? I mean, I think we already fixed it in one country by having uh, our friends in the U.S. elect Trump. So uh, that's a step forward. But also, uh, I think the correct way to go about it is, is to uh, talk with media so that we have a proof, we have a sci re real scientific research that uh, for the anti-money laundering work, uh, the current regulations uh, restricting centralized exchanges is enough. And uh, it's already stopping uh, most of terrorist funding. We know that uh, terrorists, they, yes, they use USDT and the Bitcoin and so on, and especially North Korea is, is kind of a pain in the butt, but it's not, it's not very significant still. Crypto has grown, but still it's, it's super small compared to, you know, all the other gas and oil and whatever there is going around. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we have one there. Last question. I, uh, what do you think about companies like Chain Analysis and other deaths? Do you think they make a positive impact? Uh, some, some yes, some no. Like uh, uh, some of them are pro crypto, but some of them are uh, part of this uh, compliance industry co complex, and they only like uh, see how they could uh, seek rents. And usually, you can you can know if the company is pro crypto or is here only for money if you read their reports, and if they are doing so-called uh, fear selling, like they, they are doing the reports saying that so many terrorists are coming and the blockchain is only used for money laundering and drugs and so on, and they saw the curves like how it's bad usage is growing, which by the way is not anymore growing. It, it means that they are selling the fear to the governments who then buy their services. But some good companies, like I think, uh, Chain analysis is one of the good ones. They, they create reports that are balanced and they show that, yeah, some things are bad, but some things are actually very good. Okay, thank you very much.